already remedial training here. There we go.
She's the new me. Um, Artelia Houghton, our safety coordinator. Um, and Dennis Calloway, our grants manager, just slipped out. Oh, okay, he just slipped out. So we have a very good agenda for you all uh, this morning, um, a really good lunch. And um, I will turn it over to Janice to do our safety protocol and our introductions of our speakers this morning. So thank you all for coming this way. And uh, last but not least, don't forget, we do have a survey on your um, agenda. So um, before you leave today, I just um, remind you to take out a survey so we know how we're doing. And also, please look at the mail. I sent each of you um, something, so um, hopefully it gets to you before the uh, holiday break. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, I just want to reiterate what Julia was saying. We're trying to stay in contact with relevant information. Julia is a very uh, strong person in making sure that we're communicating well. And not only are we communicating well, but we're communicating uh, the things that you need to know. So that's why the feedback at the end is very, very important. And today was one of the, one of the topics, two topics that I brought up today because it was feedback that I was hearing uh, around about, uh, I would walk around and do uh, calls questions were even asked about fire marshal, what are the codes, what are the laws, there's different things going on here. And I had an opportunity to meet Mr. Matt Cornell at a fire marshal's convention. They do have those. And, uh, and there, was, there was a lot of good things that he said there. And the biggest thing was, he says, we need to collaborate better, uh, the ISVs and the fire marshals. Um, so he's coming to do that today. And then also our other topic will be after lunch, and it will be Amy, Kathy, that's coming from the Texas School Safety Center, to answer all of our questions about what is happening when, what's up with that timeline, what's going on, what's next. So she'll be able to, to uh, address those issues. So right now I want to bring up Matt. Um, and I have his bio on my phone, but I will say that my eyesight, I don't want to ruin your reputation <laughs> and mess up your information. I know that people want to get to the information that you have, and I want to give you as much time as possible. So here's Matt Cornell. City of Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How y'all doing today? So, I am Matt Quill. I'm with uh, the City of Alton. I'm the fire marshal there. And uh, I also work part time for a company called EFI Global as a co consultant and an investigator for them. Um, so, today, here we are for our emergency operations meeting. Topic developing a relationship with the fire marshal. Um, I throw this slide here, it's a little odd from the different ones, but you know, okay, education with crayons and everything. Well, my first PowerPoint that I did presenting to a school was in 2002, and that's what the slide looked like without the uh, Greg Houston going over the top. So 2002, here we are 15, 16 years later with what we've come up with and how far we've come as far as our safe and secure schools. We still have a problem with the relationship to the fire marshal. So one of the things that you might find different about me as we talk and everything, I'm a journeyman plumber. What's a fire marshal doing being a journeyman plumber, right? But what's interesting is that trade was something that um, started me with my care and concern about safe schools. So think about it. What happened in 1937? Who can tell me? Okay, 1937 in London, Texas. Right? Oh, a lot of blank faces here. Go back and research that, all right? So in 1937, there was a new London school explosion due to a gas leak. From that, out of that tragedy, <laughs> came code requirements that required gas to be odorized. The other thing is, is if you're in the, in the HSE world for schools, you ever wonder why you got to do gas tests now? 1937, okay? So, 
most all of the things that we see from schools and, and see as far as code and rule requirements thing come about due to tragedies, right? So we'll see those changes. So kind of think about that. We're going to talk a little bit about dates and times and some of this history, and that's important. I think we've learned certainly from the school security side, certain dates are very important for keeping our schools secure and being more alert and more aware, right? All right. Um, what is a fire marshal? Well, or what is a fire marshal, right? So there's Wiki's definition of a fire marshal. All right. You know, fire marshal duties vary. Uh, usually includes fire code. Most of the time, they're experienced firefighters, may carry a weapon, might have a badge. So, top picture up there, that's kind of hoping what you're hoping to get, right? You want that experienced professional. You want those bars and stars. One of the things we notice that man has five stripes on his sleeve. That's a cheap level. So, your fire marshals can vary in, in rank depending what agency they're with. Um, so, it can vary from a, from a lieutenant or a captain to even the chief level or being the head of the department. So, you're hoping for that. What do you get? What do we get most of the time? We get fire marshal bill, don't we? <laughs> all right. We've all had that fire marshal bill over the years of being with schools, correct? Now, I'm going to challenge you with this. Where do you get the top guy, or where do you get fire marshal bill? What do they both have in common? Authority. <laughs> Somewhat, okay. You're right. Fire marshals have some unique things that they're able to do, such as subpoena power, okay? Police departments love fire marshals in that aspect because they can get into things sometimes they normally will get into. The more, the more professional and the goof. What do they have in common? Passion, right? They are passionate about what they do. They are passionate about safety. And if you go back to Saturday Night Live, some of the things you, you can visualize some of the stupid things that Fire Marshal Bill did. But did he have a point? And was he passionate about it? Absolutely. Just didn't quite get it there the right way, right? And the rest of us have had to fight that for years. So they're passionate about what they want to do. They're passionate about the safety. And why is that? You know, if you're an experienced Fire Marshal, if you're experienced law enforcement, Somewhere in your career, you have held a dead child in your arms. That's a sad thing. But the thing is, what I'm kind of getting to is when you talk about this passion, one of the things that fire marshals hear a lot of times is, man, you're not thinking about the kids. Well, full car, <laughs> okay? This, we are absolutely thinking about the kids. We are picturing, picturing, picturing that risk in a different way, right? You might be looking at that risk from a um, education standpoint, where we're a visual learner, and yet that fire marshal is asking you to take that paperwork down. So we're just looking from we're, we all have the kids in mind, don't we? We're just looking from a different community or from a different through a different window, maybe. So let's talk about who regulates fire marshals. <coughs> All right, they're regulated by their agency, but what about at the state level? Where's their education and professional standards? So we have NFPA standards. NFPA 1037 is for fire marshals, 1033 for fire investigators, and 1031 for fire inspectors. Those three standards are the JPRs, or job performance requisite for whatever position you hold. So there actually is a standard that says there's these things that you must be capable of doing and have knowledge of before you go out there and do it. The other one here, um, Texas Commission on Fire Protection. Texas Commission on Fire Protection also has rules and actually are the ones that actually credential your fire marshals, your firefighters. Anyone in a fire profession will be credentialed through this. And then if that fire marshal is a um, police officer, he's also credentialed and actually licensed through Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. So what I wanted to kind of bring up, if you look at that link here, we start talking about credentialing. I'm not going to have enough hands here, let's see what we do. So this link here is certification verification. 
You can go to the Texas Department or, of uh, Fire Protection and you pull this link up and you can type in that fire professional's name. So you want to get to know your fire marshal, let's, let's talk about what is their name, who are they. So I'll put my name in here. So one of the cool things is here is you can take this website, whatever your fire marshal or fire professional is in your area that's coming into your school to do these inspections. You know what? Get their name, find out who they are, and look them up. Through here you can scroll through their certifications. You can find out their certifications are current. You can find out when they were issued. So what's that tell you? That gives you some idea of what kind of history they have. How long have they been doing this? Are they really experienced? Some of your training requirements. The other really interesting thing is their employment history. There's your fire marshal employment history. So some of you go to Harris County, I understand they've been hiring some in-house fire professionals. So you know you want to do a background check on them. Here's another method to find previous employers and everything to check up on. So one of the things we were talking earlier before we got started was about you know the lawyer doesn't ask a question in court that he doesn't already know the answer, right? So why not get to know your fire marshal and know his credentials, know his background before you start talking to him, okay? One of the things that I try to do with my um, employees, my folks, is when you're out doing an inspection, you need to get to know the customer. And I want them, it's just simple sales. You go out, you get to know the customer. You do that inspection, you get to know them, you find out something. So when you come back a year later, there's something that connects you with them. So this is another method of knowing their history and everything a little bit that might help you connect with them to make that, open that relationship up a little bit, okay? So just know your fire marshal just depends where they're at. They can be with a police agency and come in looking like they're headed for the SWAT team, okay? Uh, those are the guys that kind of scare me a little bit. Um, but you can get, but you're going to get them whether it's suit and tie. Most times, be used on a golf shirt these days. That's just kind of the culture we've got into. One of the bottom pictures I threw in here, May of 2007. That is actually me out at the Neville High School fire back in 2007. So again, had some little bit of history of investigating some fires at school. One of the things we, we start talking about fire safety and that sort of thing is, well, we don't have fires in school, you know? Well, why don't we have fires in school? Well, let's go back to 1937. We started doing some fire code stuff. We started doing some gas code stuff. So we've been practicing the fire safety part the longest, right? We've only been practicing safe and secure schools since what, 99, 2000, okay? So again, the history. So, and, and it constantly changes for us, doesn't it? So the other thing, your fire marshal yourself, you don't know, you never know what you're going to get, right? Well, then it comes down to the fire code or the code system itself. What are you going to get? So our codes, believe it or not, are changed and redone every three years. So basically a code is put into place, it's printed, and then you have another three years to insert comments or changes or anything like that. And then they'll print and adopt a new code. So currently, the International Fire Code is the current international code, okay, current international code system. Who's on the 2018? There's a 2015, there's a 2012, 2009. You know, where are you at? So the other part of, you never know what the fire marshal's going to say. How come they don't ever say the same thing? Which code are they using? Okay. Now, 
you as a school district, especially in new construction, most school districts actually adopt codes now. Have any of y'all, do you know what codes, have any of your schools adopted codes, anybody? Okay, NFPA 3000, okay, the building code, and then NFPA 1 is the fire code. Glad you brought that up. So, exactly, school districts, if they're not, especially in some unincorporated areas or the city that they're in, doesn't keep current with code, the district themselves will adopt current codes so that they can build their buildings to the most current standard. So that when it's occupied, it's not behind code, correct? So, most of your fire cities and stuff like that are using this international code system. Then most of your fire marshals are credentialed and, and uh, challenged to and tested to this international fire code, okay? But in this other corner, you have the NFPA standards, right? And I mentioned the NFPA standards as a standard for the JPRs for a fire marshal, right? Well, NFPA has their own set of codes. Historically, they were all supposed to be one set of codes. And NFPA and IFC didn't get along, and next thing you know, you still have two separate codes. So there was an evolution for that back in about 2000, which made this more difficult. So what, what brings this to this is, is you as a school are going to adopt an NFPA standard, maybe, and then the city you build that school in is on the international code system. Are we going to have conflict and differences? Absolutely. And what have the fire marshals been taught? What have been most code officials been taught? We always enforce the most stringent part of the code. Correct? You've all heard that. And for some, for the most part, you may want that for your school, so it's going to be safer, correct? So none of these things, they're going to, they're pretty close, but there's always variables. The other thing is if you go back to the credentialing. <coughs> And certainly, if you are, are in your, the HSE world of schools, if you are starting to hire inspectors for your own schools, we're seeing a trend where, where school districts themselves are having someone in risk management or the health safety area start doing their own safety inspections in school. So they're sending the school to get trained. They're using the NFPA standard, all right? They're training them to NFPA 3000, NFPA 1. That's all well and good. But just know there's a difference. So even that person in your in-house in and the fire marshal are not going to be speaking the same language. Okay? So this is why we have so many variables. Why is it that in this jurisdiction the fire marshal tells me that? In this jurisdiction the fire marshal tells me this? You know? Um, and that gets to be a problem. What we're trying to do is get everybody on the most current edition. Some cities have actually taken and adopted where the code is retroactive. You know, as soon as the new one's out, it's always the most current. The problem with that is they're always adjusting things. Uh, most cities have gone away from that because they're afraid of losing their fire sprinkler ordinance. One of the big things was that uh, they came out of the code several years ago was all residential occupancies had to be sprinkled. Had to have a fire sprinkler in every residential occupancy. And it's still in the international code. But the state of Texas has used legislation to take it out, and we're not allowed to enforce that. So it's still a big issue right there. I think, how many of y'all actually are in the construction side? Anybody? Okay. So in the evolution of your schools, you've dealt with your school having non-fire rated corridors, non-sprinkled to fire rated corridors, then fire rated corridors with sprinkler system and firewalls, and now with sprinkler and no firewalls. Right? And we can leave the doors open on a hallway. So just take that right there. Which school building are you in? You know, do the doors have to be closed or not in the hallway? That's always an argument. And is that confusing for our, for our educators? Absolutely. So sometimes when the fire marshal just tells you straight across the board, just close all the doors. That just seems to be the easiest answer. Because the answer is different for each building. What code was it built under? Okay. So again, getting to develop this relationship, getting to know folks is, it's important to know what code was that building built under. And certainly that's one of the things that I looked out on when I started out, is I had a fire marshal that taught me, don't go out and force the code on a building if you don't know the history of that building. If you don't know what that building was built to, 
or better yet, what legislator, what councilman had something to do with that building when it was built, all right? And for you guys, it's the school board. For me, it's the school board, okay? You know, climbing up a tree with the school board is usually a losing battle. So uh, I'm learning to behave myself a little bit. Uh, older and wiser, I guess. So just know, <laughs> again, we're dealing with different codes. So what codes do they have and everything? So why do we need to develop relationships? I throw this slide up here. Um, this is an incident right here. So after uh, the tragedy in Santa Fe, um, they developed a 30-member board to go out and, and assess their schools and decide what's best for the school. If you look at that 30-member board that they had, the two people they left off was the building official and the fire marshal. So if you're making decisions about a safe and secure school, don't you think those are two important people to include? Absolutely. So these are one of the things, why do we need to develop our, we need to get the other fire marshal, we need that fire official involved so that we can to take care of our school, make it safe, and again, not take it out. So what, that's probably what happens in the fire marshal, you and the school district make a decision. We're gonna put door stoppers on all the doors and prop them open. I see some grins out here, y'all know. Right, fire marshal comes in, does special, take them all back off. Well, would it have been a little cheaper to ask the fire marshal in the first place, can we do this, you know? Because there's some fire marshals out there after you've installed that and you drill holes in the door and you've voided the UL listing of that fire rated door. And they're going to ask you to replace the door. Besides, just take the stop door stoppers off. So that's the risk that we run if we don't have that relationship. What is that fire marshal thinking? What code are we on? Okay, what is that fire marshal thinking? It's something that you know you may never know. <laughs> so, all right, here's another situation I'm going to bring up that I actually learned about recently. Uh, Fort Bend ISD. And Fort Bend folks, I'm not just picking on you, but it's an issue. Um, this is actually their police chief's blog, and he was touting about the grant money and everything that they went through and uh, to make the school safer and secure. They installed rhino locks, used grant money to install rhino locks. And their risk manager had actually talked to me and said that they had consulted with uh, the fire marshals in the area, and they all approved it. The unfortunate thing was is they did not actually consult with. They trusted that she dealt with the county fire marshal on the county level. And that did not trickle down to the cities. So the county fire marshal approves it, but yet here comes the city fire marshal comes in for a school that's in the city limits, and he's like, what the heck is this? And you gotta take it off now. Why is that? Okay? So again, that's one of the problems that we fight with as a school district. The school district doesn't stop at the city limits, does it? It doesn't stop at the county line. So again, you've got to know what that authority you have in jurisdiction is. Develop that relationship with the fire marshal. Everybody is going to speak a little bit different. They're going to be on a different section of the code. And the sad thing is, is this locking mechanism is only approved in the 2018 code. So if anybody's on anything less than a 2018 code, it's not going to be approved. Okay? And we go back to the most stringent part of the code, so which would be no. And again, I'm learning the word no is not something that should be in our vocabulary, right? Someone asks you, they want to do something, know the code well enough, give them three choices to do it, let them pick which, which is the poison, right? Seems to be a little, way, a little better way of surviving that. So again, just one of those situations, fire marshal need to be involved. So one of the things that we've been trying to do, um, I've done it in the city of Alton. We actually did it back when I worked for Fort Bend County. Um, Cade School District, Fort Bend ISD. They have a meeting in the summertime. Summer, June, July, August. They would gather all the fire marshals up, all the jurisdictions up that their school district serves. They'd sit them down at the table and say, what are the rules this year? Okay. And we would sit down. So the nice thing is, is, is uh, I've learned a lot of things because one of the simple things that you, and back with Fort Bend Group, you know, the fire marshal there, we, we allow them to spray tree curtains and paper goods. All right? It was non-fire, you know, non-combustible, right? So we put spray on fire retardant treatment on it, and it meets the code. All right? Fire marshals were good with that. What we learned that was all of a sudden the risk manager said, you know what? Wait a minute. 
We're not spraying nothing because that's a liability back on the person that's doing it. And what Fort Bend was doing was they were having their custodians do the treatment and log what curtains had been treated, what had been cleaned, and everything like that. It fell on the custodian. Was the custodian trained by the manufacturer of the product to apply it? No. So all of a sudden, risk management-wise, we had this huge liability. So Fort Bend says, nope, no treatment. And as I was talking to Spring back here, same thing. We're not allowing that. So again, some of you've made a decision that's more stringent than the code, haven't you? Does it make sense? Yes, Absolutely. So again, is what code we're applying, the things we're trying to do, does it make sense? Common sense. Eh, that doesn't happen too often, does it? But that's kind of what we're trying to do. So again, as we get to know the fire marshals and get together with them, um, one of the things I would highly recommend in your district is gather together in the summertime and uh, sit down and visit with them. Once you come up with those rules, then go ahead and make those rules district policy. Why not? Because one of the things you don't want is your fire marshal coming in and writing a ticket to the principal. Or you don't want that fire marshal writing a ticket to a teacher. Right? We deal enough with crying teachers, don't we? Okay? So as a fire marshal, I'm not writing a ticket because that is not good for me. So if you make it district policy, you know, here's the district rules for fire safety. We've already done district rules for securing the doors, haven't we? Include that as part of the safety package. So now, when the fire marshal or your in-house inspector comes along and says, hey, we've got this issue, bring it to the principal's attention. Who's responsible for enforcing that and taking care of it? It's district policy. It's up to the principal, isn't it? Does it make all of our life a little easier? What else does it do? We're going to use that fancy word in power, doesn't it? That principal is still in charge of their school. And that's the cool thing. One of the things that I've learned from the back side of that is, you know what? If it's district policy and I just bring it to the attention of the principal, they're still in control. And if they're still in control, they're usually pretty easy to get along with, aren't they? So, again, hard lessons that we learn. Here's that rhino lock that uh, was installed um, in Fort Bend. One of the interesting things was, Again, this lock is only allowed in 2018 code. Most fire marshals right now are still not permitting the lock. This is a little different version. I'll let this pass around and kind of look at the instructions. It's actually attaches and mounts the same way. You put the plates on here. This piece is actually supposed to install in a secure area or kind of like underneath the teacher's desk or something where it's not readily accessible to the students. This one's all in one piece. So what it is is the 2018 code says that secondary locking devices can be added, okay, as long as that secondary locking device is able to be openable from the outside. Okay? So that's locked in place. So what do they give you? This widget. All right? I know firemen and I also know police officers. You give them a coat hanger and they will bet that 10 ways to Sunday before they ever get that door open. And this is approved by the minimum standard of code in the 2018 standard. All right? So what happened is, well, guys, we're going to pass it around, take a look at it, there's pieces and everything. Um, so what we're going to run into is they did this, and these wire releases were on the custody and control of the sergeants. All right? All their control sergeants, all their school sergeants were in control of that wire. Is there a sergeant at every school? So that meant your school did not have this wire in place. So what happened? One of the kids dropped it in place and latched the door. He's in the classroom by himself. How long did it take him to get that wire there to get the child out of the classroom or let the teacher back in? So this is one of the things that concerns me is you go to these kind of devices, if you're going to approve them, if your fire marshal approves them, uh, your building official approves them, then make sure these wires are readily available. You know, um, you're all probably familiar with the Knox box system. That wire doesn't fit the Knox box. Probably should be. So now you're looking at the expense of increasing the size of the Knox box or for putting some other locking door assembly, maybe near the fire alarm or if there's space in the fire alarm, to lock, you know, five or six of these wires up in there. 
so they are accessible to your resource officers. Okay? Um, so just something to think about. So when we start talking about these locking devices, my biggest concern is you put these in place for the worst case scenario. Go through school history. Has all the bad stuff that's happened, has anyone walked in with a battering ram and knocked the door down? No. They've not gone past locked doors. And we've all learned about the term soft target, right? So the door's closed and locked. Why do we need these? So my, my point is, save your money. Close and lock the doors. You know? Go ahead. Okay, and I understand um, this locking mechanism, but does it conflict with ADA? Yes. I believe so. That, that's, that's, that was one question. And absolutely, I would believe it does. And then you turn around, and how do you enforce ADA? Who enforces that? So it is a you, you internally enforce that, don't you? Okay. Yes, I, I was making sure that we said it, so we heard it. it is it conflict with ADA? I would say so, yes. That's a little bit outside of my scope, but I would believe yes. Because, again, the code says open from the inside, single action, right, without knowledge of special tools. So there is the code from 2018 that says, all right, as long as we have that, you can put that secondary device that's capable of being open from the outside with a key or approved means. And it's got to meet all the 1010 standards, which is open from the inside without special tools or knowledge. The other exception, which is good, is remote operation blocks compliant with 1011 port shall be permitted. All right, most all of y'all have gone to lockdown procedures, right? Most of you have gone to electronics where all of our exterior doors with a remote push of a button. That school is locked, whether that principal wanted it locked or not. Correct? But that locking mechanism does not defeat the emergency egress. All right? Panic hardware still works. You just can't get in. So that, again, the code is finally caught up with where we've been doing, going as far as mag cars and rekeying our doors to our school. That was one of the first things we started doing, um, mostly after Santa Fe. That's been one of the big things for grant money. Um, so, the code's caught up with it. You will not find this verbiage in the 2015 code or 2012 code. So again, it's important to know who your authority you having jurisdiction is. Get to know that fire marshal, know that relationship. Alright, so the top left is the device that I'm passing around. Um, I'm not promoting one device or, other, or any of them for that matter. Um, we have actually, in the Harris County uh, uh, Grand Houston Fire Marshal's Council, have pretty much collaboratively said no to these devices. I think there's other issues about that. And certainly, disabling the uh, closure. How many of y'all had to deal with that Pinterest when it came around with teachers coming to you and wanting to buy fire hose? You know? Man, my phone was ringing for days when that Pinterest idea came out. The fire department offered the hose for free. The fire department offered yeah. Yes, I've heard that. Yeah. And I, I visited the fire departments about that and said, now you, have, you are liable. You gave them the stuff. You're liable for that. So the code in 2018 specifically prohibits that. Okay? Now, let me ask you this, folks. The, uh, the ADA requirements was a new, new thought process. I hadn't even thought that. But how about this? You've got these devices in place. What about teacher assaults. Does this give students the opportunity to assault a teacher? Does this delay your response? Okay? And I'm going to leave it at that. Assaulting the teacher is probably the least of some of the bad things that can happen in that classroom if you give a student the opportunity to lock the door and keep you out. So again, I go right back to the normal locking device that's on that door close and lock that door at all times, and make sure the teachers have the keys with them, okay? Teachers out there, I, you know, I'm sorry. We've heard this all the time. The tools are in place. Carry your ID and keys with you at all times, period. If not, days off, sorry, you know? But I think that saves the schools a lot of money. It saves us a lot of liability, and uh, keeps the fire marshal happy, <laughs> right? 
All right, can you make the lock and device? Do these, these aren't openable from the outside, are they? So how many of y'all using these devices right here? Um, I see a lot of go check your schools. What are some of the requirements for star testing now, securing the star test? Uh-huh, single, right? So now we're getting these on our door knobs, and that one person responsible for testing has that key. Got a problem. It, it, it's a problem for allowing access, right? So I had a debate about this. We're going to talk about the Knox box system. Uh, I've been working with uh, the album. This is kind of new to me too, but I've been trying to get this key put in the Knox box. But what I do is have one person that's responsible for that key goes with me and we lock it in the box. So they are able to testify, yes, it was secure. So, but anyhow, any of these homemade devices, right? Anything come up with what can be made in the shop class? So this, again, is why we need to be in our schools. So that was kind of what, what got me. Back in early 2000, I started with, with a program called um, Every School, Every Semester. Me as the fire marshal, I inspect every school every semester. And what was interesting, it was right before, before uh, when I started that, I had been doing it about a year when uh, Houston Fire Marshal's office got in trouble for not inspecting Houston schools. And they called our office and said, how many times do you inspect your schools? Twice a year. The report about fell out, you know? So was that important? Yes. Is it there to beat up the teachers? No. Why am I there? I'm there to teach. You see me. I'm comfortable. All right? I looked at a lot of old people in here, right? Older people. Like me. <laughs> I'm in trouble for that one. <laughs> so, but seriously, we were all threatened when we were younger for, with a truancy officer, weren't we? Did we ever see a truancy officer? Nope. But we went to school, didn't we? What are we doing with the teachers? If you don't do this, I'm calling the fire marshal. The teachers need to be comfortable with the fire marshal. So again, I've been urging our fire marshals through this council and everything to say, look, get out there, get visible, get to know the teachers. Where you're walking through that school, teacher walks in, hey, I've got this event coming up. It's Christmas time, right? We want to do a door decorating contest. How do we do that? Yeah. Okay? So here you go. Instead of fire <laughs> Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> we all deal with this every every holiday, don't we? So, you know what, reach out to that fire marshal and say, hey, what's the rules? How can we do this? You know, a smart fire marshal will say, you know what, here's three ways. Pick which one works for you, okay? Because, you know what, if we go back to the letter of the law, letter of the code, what code you on? Is it a fire rated door or not? Is it sprinkled or not? All those are variables that say where well, you can and you can't. And I'm going to stop with that because if it gets out, what the real truth is, <laughs> we're all going to be in trouble. So, uh, so anyhow, that's the beginning. Why do we have the relationship? Okay, simple things like that. Be looking for those devices. I want the teachers can, uh, comfortable with asking questions. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Are round doorknobs allowed? Depends on the code. So, round doorknobs, the round doorknobs comes into play for ADA requirements. Okay, it really doesn't fit from a fire code standpoint, it doesn't. That's your ADA requirements. So, that, you need to sit down and have a conversation with that problem. Where are you coming from? You know, we want to do this, but can you tell me the why? Teach me why. That's, that should be the number one response. Teach me why we're doing this. And show me the code. So, the round door knobs, to the best of my knowledge, is ADA. And if it is an existing installation, it doesn't need to be changed until you do a significant remodel. Okay? We do a significant remodel, which is usually around 50% of the value of the building. If you do, it, and that's a rule of thumb, folks. That's nothing. I can't show you in black and white. Says, oh, you're going to do 50% of the building. You've got to bring up the code. It's kind of a rule of thumb out there. That's where you start looking at everything needs to be done and everything. So that's why we always do projects on a smaller scale, right? So um, if you would, 
if you have the opportunity to get my email or my card, shoot me an email. I'll do the best I can to look it up in the code because that's the other side of that. If you're going to question your fire marshal, you're going to question your code official, if you're going to question the police officer, know the rules. You know? We're going to have a whole lot more respect for someone that says, hey, I opened the code book. I read this. This is what it means to me. Can you tell me what it means to you and where we're at? And I guess it's one of the things, I, one of the slides I missed back on the codes. You'll notice there was an NFPA 101 handbook, and there was also an uh, IFC code commentary. So you have the black and white of the code. The handbook and the commentary are the part of the code book that actually give you the why. <coughs> All right. What were they thinking when they, they put this in the code or made this code change? So that's something to look at. Having the code book and having a code commentary is always very handy to have. Um, the IFC or the International Code are not available online because somebody wants to sell those. Um, and if they, some of the NFPA standards you can get. But again, ask for that copy from the code official. They have the libraries have those codes in stock. Okay? The libraries are actually required to keep a copy of what the city has adopted. So that's another really useful. All right, how many of y'all using these magnets and everything? <laughs> They'll work on the door breaks, no. But this was real fun. How many of we all went through these, what, 10 years ago at least? And some are still in place. And then we had, okay, what code you Is it a fire door or not? Fire door, have closure, can't do this. Here's one of my thought processes, okay? We kind of talk about thinking and being safe and everything. Um, so well, there's still a lot of schools out there right now that are very dependent on this magnet. The door is locked. And the procedure is, in the event of emergency or lockdown, we sweep the lock, pull the door closed. That's all well and good. Where's the teacher teaching from? Back in that corner? Where's the door? How long does it take to get across the classroom? The problem that was there that she needed to close the door for was already in the room before she swept that bag. Back to close the door and lock it. So here's one of my other thoughts. If you do use this magnet procedure, I, I'm not calling it that's your procedure, that's your procedure. That's the best you've got for right now. Why not rearrange classrooms? Rearrange our classrooms so that your educator is between the students and the door. Right? We've already told our educators they're what? You're the protector of your students, aren't you? It is your responsibility to protect those kids. So why not be between the door and them? The problem's out there, right? Get the door closed and locked. Be there to protect your kids. So if you look at most classrooms, and what's kind of funny, I've never figured out why, maybe someone here can tell me. I've noticed high school classrooms, the teachers usually get the door. And yet, at elementary school, the higher risk is back in the corner. Yeah. And then I hear, well, keep your door closed and locked all the time. But if so-and-so goes to the bathroom, then I gotta lock over and open the door. Exactly. Whatever's coming in your room, do you not want to greet it? Do you want to make that decision of what's coming in your room or not? You would certainly do it at your own home, wouldn't you? What's the difference? So, again, I just back to kind of that, that thought process. Let's get the doors closed and locked. Yes, sir. A, a different thought process because we do use magic. We also use a, a laminated paper strip, like a door hanger. Yes. But the process is that door is always locked. That's never been. Mm -hmm. Unless the sub goes out of the classroom, so that the sub takes their kids to lunch, then that door is unlocked and they can get back in. But we're not having to do that emergency with kids. Mm -hmm. Or if they're taking their kids to the bathroom, then that's their means to get back in the class. But any other time, that door is always locked mm -hmm. while there's a mm -hmm. of those kids in the classroom. Absolutely. And the other thing, that's the other benefit of this, is you can be in the hallway and you can hop in any classroom, sweep, and lock the door. Right. So that's back to, again, you know, where are we at on key in our schools? We master key or not. You know, does a teacher only have a key to her classroom or does she have a master key to all classrooms? You know, that certainly is an expense, but it's a thought process there, too. Um, so you mentioned that, too, the kids in the classroom, you mentioned subs and everything. How many of y'all are pushing for go bags? Most schools, I see go bags at the elementary level, do you have them at the high school level? How do you track your kids there, you know? Um, the other thing in the go bag process, I see the go bags in the classroom. When the kids go to gym, they go to specials, they go to lunch, the go bag doesn't go with them. Okay? We've assigned someone to close the door when you leave. Assign someone to catch that go bag. Take the little uh, hooks 
and your cafeteria, stick them on the, 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 the chair or on the ta end of the table. When that classroom comes and sits down, they hook their go bag. If we have a, a reason to uh, relocate the kids, to evacuate the kids, whatever, that go bag is there. Then even your, your aide can have accountability for those class or for those students until the teacher gets to them. So it's another process of another layer of using that go bag. All right, so we're Dr. Goldwalks again. Um, this is what I recommend, new construction-wise, folks. This is what you want to have, deadbolt latch, okay? You're all familiar with these being in your hotels, right? You go into a hotel room, you, you mag the card in, you get in there, and you go to bed, and you lock the deadbolt, and that door's locked from the inside, outside with a deadbolt. But you have one movement of the hand downward, and you're out. So again, this is a deadbolt latch. This is a perfect uh, a locking assembly if you're developing and designing these tools. I highly recommend this. It meets all requirements. It does make sure the doorway is much more secure. So one of the interesting things is if you go back to our schools that were built in the 60s and 70s, this is the locking mechanism they were using, except for the fact that it was around the rock. So interesting. How many are dealing with Knox box systems? OK, that's frustrating, isn't it? All right, so every new building I got to build, I got $300 to spend on, on at least one, if not two, Knox boxes, right? <laughs> All right, fire marshal is going to hate you for this. Number one, if you're going to comply, you're going to, okay, city ordinance, whatever, compliance is kind of a mandatory. But the other side of that is how is that fire department, how are they securing their key? In other words, the key to that Knox box is the key to the city. It, it's, it's done, it's, it's pinned to the zip code. All right? So, once I've got the box box key, I've got access to everyone on this pin to the zip code for that key. All right? Now, if the fire department has that key just thrown in their Knox box, or thrown in their glove box or their truck, or the fire marshal's carrying it around in his pocket all the time, is that key secure? Nope. So, Knox system, part, the other part of the Knox system, the rules, is the key to that city is supposed to be secure to trucks. All right, there's different ways. There's locking mechanisms where you punch in a code, which you got to call the dispatcher and ask them to release it. Um, so if, as far as getting to know your fire marshal, ask him how his, what, I'm worried about, you know, and your, your step into this is you're talking about releasing the key for the fire test to that room. You know, how is your Knox key secure? Okay, I would be very cautious about my compliance and question my compliance with installing Knox boxes if that fire department is not securing that key and not responsible for it, that key needs to be locked under all times, preferably dual control or some sort of computer uh, monitoring of that key. You're smiling, but you're ready to. Well, we have them everywhere. We've had instances with fire, fire department, engineer, mm -hmm. emergency issues. They never use it. They use the axe or the door break, and they break the doors, and I always go, we got the key right there. Yeah. We're hard to break the door. And you know, that's, that's kind of, I run that problem now all the time because we, I've got enough staff. I have 90% of my buildings annually inspected. My schools are inspected twice a year. That Knox box is open twice a year. You got to get Brian call me at 3 in the morning. Hey, there's Knox box. <laughs> <laughs> well, look it up. You know, they've got a computer terminal in the truck list where they're at. So, yeah, Brian, uh, uh, Mongo. We, we got Mongo. I'm sorry. I can't fix that. <laughs> we got fire marshals that are Mongo out there, too. Uh, but, anyhow, uh, just kind of one of those things, the Knox box system, the beauty of the Knox box, if they'll use it, is think of a college campus or a high school campus. You've got multiple buildings. Put a box on each building. If your problem's at the front door, go to the Knox box in the back of campus. If you've gone through and master keyed your buildings, okay, then your Knox box, every Knox box should have the same thing in it. A master key, a mag card, and your master gate key. Every box is keyed the same. So if we do have that problem, then you have that relationship with the fire marshal and the fire department to go open these boxes and what do we do? Here's your keys, Mr. Police Officer. SWAT team, have a good time. We'll be out here. Tell us you need us, right? I laugh about that, but that's the other side of this. You get these, we're, we're working towards all this, this free key and everything. Your Knox box can be a great resource for you as far as when you start setting the command system and everything. Um, it can contain keys for everything. You can match the pad box. The other thing, notice the thumb drive. We can put floor plans, disaster plans. We can put our relocation plan, our reunification plan, all on that thumb drive in that Knox box. 
So that's available to the fire department to use or for them to share back with you if you had to leave in a hurry. Okay? So that's one of the nice things about that. And again, I'm talking about the fire code and everything. Tell the fire that they are, uh, I try to tell the fire marshals that they're not food compared to the stuff that you have to do. Because the fire marshals out there are concerned about the fire code, aren't they? And I try to get them to, you know, broader picture folks. You know, look at the safety, look at the security. You know, what is vulnerable in that school? The fire code addresses evacuation and lockdown plans. Nowhere does the fire code talk about shelter in place. Uh, what are you going to do for your hazmat? Most fire marshals don't even understand what a hold procedure is. And I've laughed at them and then uh, our environmental folks. One of the perfect times for a hold procedure is when somebody's puked in the hallway, right? Let's get that cleaned up before whatever it was made them sick and spread to everybody. And uh, so health and influenza, y'all, you know, we got, we got uh, the cough or whatever, you know. Again, back to being having the diarrhea issues, the belly issues. We, these go through our schools rapidly, right? We want to stop as quick as possible. Fire marshals don't understand your procedures for that. Again, develop that relationship, share it with them, because they can use the fire code to help you, I believe. Okay? Or have a better understanding why maybe they can't do something in the fire code to help you out. So, um, NIM is used practice daily is another thing that uh, they, the fire marshal don't realize that that's something that's become a requirement for y'all. Y'all are very familiar with this, right? I throw this slide up at the conference uh, this year, and the fire marshals looked at it and went, huh? It was new to most of the fire marshals. So I've been trying to get this out to all the fire marshals. Hey, this is a tool, you know. Go look at Texas State's website and all the tools that are there. Be familiar with how you're going to use these tools to help the school districts uh, do better. Um, the NIMS training. All right. How many of y'all going into the man now? Okay. This structured system where somebody's got to be in control, right? But what happens? We just talk about fire marshals, they don't know where they're at. We don't know what code we're on. Everybody uses NIMS in a different fashion and may even speak a different language. So trying to get one person in control with a big, big word, unified command. I want everybody from each community or each, you know, and we're going to get involved in that. I see this badge says police chief. Am I going to be able to hold you in the command location? Nope. We're on it. Right. So, so that's one of the things is, is so getting used to and using this command system and the NIMS is very important to help you integrate with the police department and the fire marshals and everything. The more you use it, the better off you are. So here's my challenge to you. Operate a football game off, off of uh, instant command system. Okay, perfect opportunity. Okay, we ran the Super Bowl that way, right? You should have seen that little chart. So again, I would challenge you to take an opportunity to back to your schools. Just let's start filling out those two or threes or whatever those forms are to operate a football game. You get people used to filling out the form, used to filling those roles, and when you really need it for an emergency, it'll fall back in place pretty quick. Um, I've, I've learned from my area. And as far as being on committees in Fort Bend County, um, we run our fair that way. You know, Alvin runs some of our events, our community events that way. Um, so it's very helpful to use it all the time. So I just throw it out there. So when the real emergency comes, you're real familiar with this, and it's not Greek language to you. Oh, three of the alert training and everything. All right, most of all, it's familiar with alert training, right? Um, bringing the fire world into it, bringing the EMS world into it is relatively new. Okay. And what's really interesting, here's, here's one of the things, get to know your fire department, get to know your fire marshal, are they paid or volunteer? Because here's the stigmatism I'm running into. If the responding fire department are volunteer firemen, the police department is not interested in including them in the alert training because they're volunteer. What information are we releasing to a non-professional? Yeah, you'll hurt someone's feelings. You're not a professional. We're all professionals, volunteer or not, you know? So that's one of those things, that's, that's another bridge to, to cover. But the alert training is another gap where you folks in the school district are very aware of your fire and EMS world or not. All right, it's new to them. Are they anxious to participate? Yes, because they think they're going in guns blazing. Um, got news for them on that one too. But it's a different way of thinking, and it's a different way of bringing that back into the command. 
All right, one of the things I've done now, and it's, it's kind of thing, is, is all these knock boxes around, right? We as the fire department, we as the fire marshals, if you have an incident, that's what I'm doing. I'm coming to the knock box, I'm getting keys to you, and I'm giving you access. I'm going to show you the uh, floor plan and the blue plan of where you're going, and I'm going to talk you through it. You know, that's our involved as far as work right now. So, just some, some thought process there. Um, I'm almost finished. We're getting close, aren't we, Jens? Three minutes. <laughs> um, the incident command system, how many of y'all are labeling you the outside of your building now? You're labeling the doors. So, that, okay? So, just a bad situation that I've learned the hard way from is A side. First off, if you go look at this and the NFPA scan, this is not, that picture in the bottom is not there. It's kind of more of a rule of thumb. The A side is whatever is normally the address front of the building, and that varies so much. So my suggestion here is, number one, remember that as you go around the building, you go around the building clockwise. So as we label buildings, always go around clockwise, not counterclockwise. And wherever you put the big numbers at the front, okay, if it's 2443 Gordon Street, then you face the front of that building, that, that, that door, right below should be labeled door A1. And then take it counterclockwise from there. That way everybody can understand it, okay? Uh, I did have a building, they did that, I didn't pay attention, I actually passed the occupancy and realized they weren't <coughs> building counterclockwise when I walked the fire department through. So, yeah, I'm really responsible for labeling those doors, you know? So, all right, I'm gonna just wrap this up real quick. We've talked about risk sponsor. You know, there's a lot of things out there about the radio controls and stuff like that. I've been teaching the fire marshals right now. Uh, this, this has been in the code for a while. There's no reason for us to push it because you, as educators, you as, as health safety folks, are going to fix this yourself because you need the phones and information to work for your notifications. You need your radios and your police officers to work. So I've been trying to just lay, you know, ease off this. It's coming. Uh, we had a, a little class with Bearcom folks, and they just said, good idea stuff, but it's going to change yearly, you know, it's an electronic system. So it's not proven. I really hate making schools do things that aren't proven. But every bad incident that happens, we, what is the number one thing? Communication. So know that the fire code says on these repeater systems that they are for radios. I'm looking for the commentary because I think they meant all communications. And that's the other side. So we talked about this where they need to be broadband systems where it picks up the radios for the district, it picks up the radios for the police officers, the responding fire departments, but it also needs to carry the cell phone because your push out for information on what to do is usually through the cell phone, isn't it? Okay, most all of us have got that added. So all this stuff integrates together with different systems. Um, so just know that they're out there. Uh, a good way of visiting, you've got a fire marshal that's pushing you on this repeater system. Visit with them and say, hey, we're working on it. But this is why we're not going fully to it. You know, there's some technology issues and everything doesn't match. You know, the sum is tied to your, your camera systems and everything else. So, all right, I'm gonna leave. there's all sorts of things on fire alarm stuff. We're talking about delaying the fire alarms and everything. Uh, fire marshals have different thoughts on that. Um, the biggest thing here is you sprinkle the building. If it has a fire sprinkler, then most fire marshals are gonna let you do whatever you want. They're gonna give you a little more leeway. If there's not a fire sprinkler in that building, and, all right, it's going to be pretty strict. So just be careful of that. Know whether it's strict or not, and kind of where they're coming from. Um, we asked about gates. Most all gates. If you've got a doorway, we're, we're gating our, our schools and stuff now, and fencing them. Again, gating and fencing is not new. It, TAs require schools to be fenced for years. At least we kind of got away with it and didn't do it. So if you have a set of doors that open up into an area, then now you gate it. If those doors have painted hardware and that inches of opening, your gate has to match that. Okay, so again, notice how that can part has a metal plate. Make sure if you're doing this that they put that metal plate behind it. If all they do is put the welded wire mesh, again, the good old coat hanger right through, pull it, and you're done. We haven't resolved the issue about somebody jumping over, okay? Mm -hmm. But this metal plate makes a difference in being able to open it with the wire. And uh, again, there's a cave there, there's no wire there. But notice that little orange strap, what is that? It's a toe strap. Yeah, it's one of those ratchet tie downs. Was just driving around the school, saw that, stopped, said, What is this? And guess what? The answer was the school resource officer was, Well, I can't get the students to stop opening the gate. So he put a ratchet strap down there. You know, uh, I saw a video today with a, with, with a person that was getting gas and needed gas. She was filling her grocery bag with gas on. Okay. 
So, you know, <laughs> we can try and try. So, to finish up here, uh, again, common sense approach to things, all doors should be kept closed and locked at all times. Teachers should have their school keys in their purse at all times. Don't want to give your keys out because it's teaching between the door and the students. All stakeholders need to get involved. If you're any kind of enforcement, authority have a you need to include them up front. And let's do it right the first time. We're not tearing things out. It goes better, a whole lot better. Uh, practicing this command at all times. I want to make sure up. I think we've seen this in some of the uh, earlier craze training. Uh, your fire extinguisher, the fire department teaches pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. How about pull, aim, squeeze, and swing? Your weapon in the school is a fire extinguisher, and it works very well. Uh, fire marshals with ID and pass, TA background. All right, last thing I'm going to close with is if you can develop that relationship with a fire marshal, all right, get them credentialed. I have learned that by going and doing the TA background fingerprint checking and getting a school ID, and when I walk into the school with a school ID, there's a whole lot of relief already. I've had teachers try to tackle me in the hallway. Who are you and why are you here? Okay, school ID. So you, that person's met the same kind of background and everything. We've all done Raptor, and those of you who heard probably think, you know, run the, the driver's license for the fire marshal, and it's fine, right? Well, I ain't leaving you my driver's license or whatever. But the point is, they, they can do it, they just need a driver's license back because they may have to go for a call, right? So that's part of the reason why I'm not going to leave the driver's license. So credential them that way. Um, whatever, get to know your fire marshal. Uh, check them out. You know, get their name. Check them out. Make sure they are trained. They are certified. Um, we all know uniforms and badges are out there on the internet, all the way around, right? So check them out. We would check out a plumber, electrician coming into our house, wouldn't we? Check out who's coming into your school with a gun. I've also been teaching all the, the fire marshals. If you're going to school for inspection, first thing you do after you check in the county. Where's the school resource officer? Let that resource officer that there is somebody else in the building that's weaponized. You know, so he's prepared that you not that you already developed a relationship there to support each other. All right. So lastly, again, credential them. Ask them if they're a peace officer. They're going to have a red, white, blue card with a picture on it. They're working for a city or county or agency. They're going to have a picture with their credentials on it, who they are. The different ways up there. You know. So ask them for that information. Develop that relationship, get to know them, know that you work with somebody, and you work well together. That's it. My card's up here, everything I can do for you. If you have code questions that I can look up and help you out with, uh, I'm, I'm here to, to support you. If you have a, I can't just come in and do this class for you and your agency and teach you what your fire marshal should do. But if you're having a problem meshing with your fire marshal, you bet. I'll be happy to sit down with you and see what I can come work out. Okay, help open that door and open that open opportunity for you. All right, thank you very much for having me. Does anybody have any questions for Matt that he can answer now? Uh, and I really, really appreciate him coming. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the relationship that we're building as far as the TDE along with the fire marshals because there's a lot of questions that people have. They may come up later. And then we have a resource that we can rely on and he will go and search out the answer. Process. Absolutely. And it's, uh, I'll be here for the rest of the day, you know, so if you have questions for the meal or everything, I got business cards up or anything I can do for you, you know. Okay. So we are going to take a break now and grab something to eat. And then after you settle down and we get going, Amy is here in the building, and so she will start her presentation in about 30 minutes, which will be 30 minutes. All right? So there is a buffet right over here. The restrooms are out to your right if you need to go and wash your hands or anything like that.
ready to go. Uh, so she's going to be able to start the presentation, but if you're still eating, continue to eat and kind of take a look. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Amy. So good afternoon. I'm Amy Kathy. Most of you may recognize my name if I say Amy Gearsack. <laughs> Gearsack. Amy with two M's who bombarded you always with emails, especially during disasters. So I left Harris County Office of Homeland Security Emergency Management in June, and I am so privileged now to work for the Texas School Safety Center, which is up in San Marcos. If you are not familiar with our agency, if you are, are not familiar with our website, please go to it today and become informed of what kind of materials are on there. So we were kind of given the mandate from the governor's office even that we will provide safety and security guidance to school districts throughout the state of Texas, including charter schools. Do I have any charter schools? and junior colleges, okay? So we provide guidance to them. We work closely with TASPE, closely with TEA, and closely with the governor's division so that we are all on the same page that whatever guidance is being pushed down to the locals, it is consistent. I did this exact same presentation Monday at Region 4, so I will not be offended if you leave early, if you were there also, but I want you to know that it is an opportunity and a privilege to be here, to be back in my hometown. I still have a home here. So I know most of your superintendents closely. I know, you know, Pam at Region 4, I work so closely with her, and then the Department of Education. We have worked together since, you know, I first came to Harris County. So you have so many awesome resources and support already available to you in this area. You work well together from district to districts. I've seen it during Harvey. I've witnessed it time and time again, and I'll try not to get emotional <laughs> because you guys are just awesome, and this will always be my home even though I'm now in San Marcos. I have my cards up here. Just as when I was at Harris County, you always had my number. I still want you to always have my number. I am always available to you regardless of where I'm at. So I'm going to talk to you about the legislative updates. We do not hang out this presentation. Uh, the reason is, is because tomorrow something may be updated. And I do not want a district looking at an old presentation thinking it's the most current information. If you want the most current information, again, I encourage you to go to our website. And I'll share our website with you when I close so that you can find the most updated information. Because we're updating it daily. You just need to know where to find it. And it's not the most... Uh, easy way to find the information. You actually have nowhere to look. Just released their update to 114. 
Monday I said it was like 900 pages and somebody corrected me and said it's like a thousand pages. Okay? So they provide the policies. So they will help you also and we're understanding their policies so that whatever we do is not in conflict. We all are trying to give you the best information. And we work so closely with them to say, hey, this is how Texas School Safety Center interpreted it. This is how, you know, talking to TEA, talking with the legislators, this is how they really meant it. Because I'll tell you, if you read Chapter 37, one of the biggest things is that prevention. You now have to have prevention. We separated prevention from mitigation, which I'll get into <coughs> also. But then you read later down, and the, and the law says four phases of emergency management. So it even contradicts itself, right? So I'm going to talk about three big categories with Senate Bill 11 and Texas Education Code 37. The first one is emergency operation plans, your EOP. Second will be your threat assessment teams. And thirdly will be your school safety committees. <coughs> and then there'll be a little bit of other things we threw in there, just to keep you wondering. But as of September 1st, school districts, when I say districts, I'm talking charter schools and junior colleges, now need to make sure they have a multi-hazard emergency operation plan. Well, that is what I used to do for Harris County. I developed Harris County emergency operation plans and annexes, and I worked with the school districts, and I worked with your jurisdictions so that we were all compliant and talking the same on everything. So you guys are so much far ahead than a lot of other areas I've been to. But as of Senate Bill 11, you now have to separate prevention. Prevention, when you think of it, think of it as something you could quickly do that doesn't cost a lot of money. Prevention might be cleaning out sandbags. Mitigation, on the other hand, lots of times you can get funding for mitigation, and that it takes longer, six months, a year, two years, and it costs a lot of money. So instead of the sandbags you use in prevention, you might use the floodgates for mitigation. So that's how I'm helping districts understand the difference. Prevention, quick, easy, inexpensive. Mitigation, longer time, takes more money. And then, of course, we always had preparedness, response, and recovery. Okay, your EOP must provide for the district training. Now, the big thing here is it started every place you read now. It says, and who? Substitute teachers. If you go back to your school today, or let's say tomorrow, how many of you still have a drill plan before the holidays? You're still going to have a fire drill or you have a drill plan, okay? You know that. Today you know that before Christmas break, we are going to have a drill. Okay. Do your teachers know that? Yes, they do, right? They know that there's a scheduled drill. I'm Amy Kathy, and I'm coming into your district the first time today as a substitute teacher. First time. Not familiar with your school. Actually, in Harris County, I'm familiar with all your schools. Okay, but I go and I check in. I need to know, by the way, there is a fire drill planned. This is what's expected of you. They may have sat through substitute teacher orientation back in July, maybe, and you may have covered all of this, but I haven't been in your school since July. I'm not going to remember, because I've been in <coughs> spring subbing, and I've been in, in leaf uh, subbing, but I haven't been in Pasadena yet. So you need to make sure, as soon as that substitute walks in, they are telling, like we said, they have the keys to the kingdom. It now mandates that substitute teachers must be trained. <coughs> they must have maps and access to the plans, just like a regular teacher would, just like your custodial staff. Okay. Again, measures to ensure district employees, including substitute teachers, have access to electronic devices. Matt talked about that. Matt, I mean, Matt set me up for this. I'm telling you, he hit all the spots. Yes, that includes cell phones. But you also want that policy that says who is allowed to. Yes, if it's a life-threatening emergency, 
Anybody in the school district, including a student, can use their cell phone and call 911. But depending on what it is, you might want that substitute teacher or the regular teacher or whomever to notify the front office because it's not an immediate threat. So you need to talk through this stuff. You need to have these trainings. You need to include substitute teachers, but the cafeteria workers, the bus drivers, custodial maintenance, everybody needs to be included. And I talked about this too. They have to have access to the school campus maps. If I walk in, you want to make sure I am doing everything I could possibly do to protect your students because that's what we said we do, right? We are charged with the safety of our students to put our body between the door and the students. So is everyone appropriately trained to do that? Some of the slides you'll see best practices. Have a safety and security committee, which I know you all have. I've sat on some of your committees, right? When you were in, at districts. So as your local emergency management personnel, that was me, I sat on some of your school safety committees. Okay. So have them working with your people, your administration, the people who are developing your planning team that's developing your emergency operation plans. Most likely they're going to overlap and have a lot of the same people. Okay, mandated drills. Again, this is on our website. So, Texas School Safety Center has recommended these eight drills to TEA. Okay. They are still, TEA is still ruling on it. It says Commissioner Rule will come out in June 2020. What I don't want you to look up there and say, ooh, Eight drills, one fire drill. No. Does it have an asterisk next to it? One per year, districts should comply with local fire codes, which are what? One a month. One a month with days, more than 10 days. All right. One a month. So at the minimum, these are your, what we said at the minimum, this is what we recommend for districts. Okay. Again, we're waiting for the commissioner rule. I don't see them changing anything. One thing we are also trying to get away from a little bit, do you see where we say shelter in place? And then we say for hazmat. And then we have shelter for severe weather. We're trying to get away from the saying shelter in place and just saying shelter. Matt talked about this, coordination. It now says that you must coordinate with, and it lists these agencies. These aren't all your agencies. <coughs> you must coordinate with Department of State Health Services. And you may accomplish it by working with your local public health. Okay. You contact them, they then follow up to dishes and wherever else. Local emergency management agencies. Some of you, most of you that I see here are actually jurisdictions, so you have your local emergency management office. But then most of you, you all sit in a county also, so you have Harris County Office of Emergency Management or whatever county you're in. So you can have one or both of those folks sitting on your safety and security committee, but also sitting on your EOP planning team. But know their faces today. When I walked in, we recognized faces. You recognize me as Amy from Harris County OEM. We know that in front of an incident. Because we have those right relationships in place, Brian during Harvey, all my school districts had a special phone number, and only they had it. And when that phone rang in the EOC, the planning team knew that was Amy's phone and it's a school, and it takes priority. This is why those relationships were so important. School districts were calling me directly, and we made sure we were available to you. Okay. Probably wouldn't have happened if we didn't know each other ahead of time. I wouldn't have gave that, I call it the Batman phone number out. Okay. You need to know your local responders. Infrastructure, Matt talked about this too, the communications. You need to make sure your district, your facilities has adequate communications. 
you are all fortunate to reside in Harris County or the surrounding counties because we have an interoperability plan that's amazing. You have access to Harris County Radio, Regional Radio Shop. Okay. You can have your local emergency management people come in and talk to you. And if you say, I'm concerned with this, then you can have the experts in Harris County come up to your school and say, this is how we have it. How can we enhance this? Or what can we do differently? I was in a school district prior to leaving in June and I grabbed one of their radios and I started testing their 800 radios. You all have your 800 radios. I tried testing it. It had not been updated. If your radio has not been touched or updated in the past two years, you're probably not, it probably doesn't work. It probably does not work. Because as Matt said, it's all going to a different platform. And it's constantly changing. Notification to parents. Why is it important to have your communications and PIO also in these kind of trainings, also in the threat assessment training? Because how do you communicate with parents? I'm going to read this for a specific reason. It says provisions for providing immediate notification to parents involving a significant threat and identify the person seeing the notification. And in another law, a few steps down, it'll say provisions for providing as soon as possible. So again, we have com competing laws here. What is immediate? What is as soon as possible? First of all, when I sat on those 4 a.m. conference calls with your superintendents, I never told them, sometimes I did, what to do. What I did is provided them the most factual information that we had at that time, provided them with what Harris County was planning on doing, shutting down the courts, whatever that may be. But at that 4 a.m. call, they were provided the most factual information so that they could make the best decisions for their districts. That's what you need to be able to do for your parents and your community. And if you tell them ahead of time, something happens. I'll share a story because my, my spring folks know this. A few years back, when the spring had the stabbing in the cafeteria, my daughter was there. My daughter went to spring high school. My ex-husband, her dad, was a coach there and a teacher there. And I was the school liaison. So I was wearing two hats that day. I was wearing my school liaison hat and trying to support spring ISD however I could. But I also had my mom's hat on, I kept sneaking in there. And I'm like, okay, I want my daughter, I want her now, kind of thing. But I knew she was okay. And I was able then to talk to the parents, and actually I was even on the news, saying that Spring ISD is doing everything they can possibly do for the, that was best for your students and keeping them safe, and what's best for the community. And that might mean they can't push out information like that. But realize it's, it's getting out like that, whether it's from your district or not. So at the beginning of school, at parent nights, whenever you have the opportunity, tell them what I just told you. We may not, and you know what, maybe the first two seconds you might tweet something. Yes, there's an incident, we are gathering facts, so you do something. We will come back at, you know, and then what's best if you've been through standard response protocol, SRP, what do we tell the kids in that class? Every five minutes, once it's allowable to turn your cell phones on, you, every five minutes you give your parents, whomever, your guardians, an update. So teach this, start implementing this the first day of school. Chain of command, or other words, ICS, NIMS. Matt talked about that. I told him, I said, he set me up. A chain of command that designates individuals. Typically, we do not want our superintendent, or maybe even our principals, as the incident commander. They're going to be too busy. They should be focusing on policy and higher level stuff. So who could be the incident commander? It might be a PE teacher. It might be a coach. Who knows? But you should think about this ahead of time. A policy for providing, responding to an active shooter. This was asked of me Monday. 
yes, and your EOP that you will now be sending to the Texas School Safety Center that we will be reviewing, <coughs> that it must specifically have a policy attached to it. And the policy could say, in regards to responding to an active shooter incident, see what standard response protocol. You don't have to repeat it. You just have to have it in there that says, you know, our district, in response to an active shooter, will be following blah. Again, TASB just let out that thousand page document. I personally don't have access to it, but I believe it has an active shooter policy. Take that, attach it to your EOP. Okay, if you're within a thousand yards of a train rail, you get this is nothing new, you know you have to have a policy. To me, this would probably be almost my same policy as my hazmat policy. Because what is it? It's not a train derailment, it's a hazmat scene. Right? So you can think about that. So you can have your hazmat annex and just have attached to it. If there's a train derailment, you might just want to have eye contact, this, this, this person. You know, whatever the rail lines are or whatever. Have those people out today to meet with them if you have a rail that runs through your school. I, if you take my card, I just came across something about pipelines also that I'm happy to share with you if you have pipelines. Same thing. What is pipelines? A hazmat scene. Do you agree, Matt? It is okay not to agree with me. So, it's not smart. <laughs> okay, polling places. How many have already used their school district as a polling place? See hands around? Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't isolate yourself. You saw those hands? Hey, can you share with me what you're doing? Okay. Students in portable buildings. We actually have a best practice on our website. It's just been updated as of sometime for our leave or student, October. So it's on our website. So provisions for supporting psychological health to students. Staff, community. Again, we hired an additional person. I am your emergency operation plan specialist. Okay. So I'm working on that. If you have an EOP question concern, it'll come to me. We hired a mental health counselor, certified mental health counselor, who's also in our office. She is now working weekly with TEA to determine all of the mental health issues and all of the mandates by Senate Bill 11 including psychological first aid. I was at Region 5, Beaumont, yesterday and the day before. And while I was there doing the threat assessment trainings, next door they were training their districts in psychological first aid. Okay, it's great. Same thing. We talked about ADA requirements and the round door handles versus the elongated door handles, okay? You must follow ADA compliancy. Also though, it says, and access and functional needs. In my emergency world, that makes total sense to me. Do you guys understand what access and functional needs means? Today, I am fine, I am upright, I can walk in, I can do stuff for myself. Tomorrow, we get another Harvey, and I lose everything. I am now considered access and functional needs. I cannot do things for myself. I cannot get in the car and travel. I lost my car. I lost my house. I lost my clothing. Or if you think of students today, I'll use my daughter Alexis, softball player, select softball player. Okay. She was at school on Monday through Friday. Saturday, she went to a softball tournament. Slid into second, girl stepped on her, fractured her ankle. Monday, she comes to school on crutches. She is now access and functional needs. She needs assistance. She now needs the per permit to use the elevator. She needs whatever. Okay, so think of that when you're planning. Okay, yeah, you all focus on maybe your 10% your over here that are, you know, ADA compliancy and disability folks. But tomorrow that can change. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, so we are charged now with the first time you have to send your EOBs to us. I am here to assure you that we are your partner in this. We are not the compliance officers. We're not going to have our guns on and our badges on and we're not going to crack that whip because you don't have something that's compliant. My first year at OEM, when I sent our EOP up to the state for review for compliancy, ooh, did I get a wake-up call? I was not compliant. They immediately took our status of being top-notch and moved us down to non-compliancy, which affects funding and everything. And my boss came to me and he's like, Amy, what did you do? I'm like, I don't know, I thought I followed the protocol. That's not going to happen to you. We are assembling a team of experts where if you're weak in one area, we're going to support you. We're going to come out to you and sit with you. We're going to call you and we're going to provide you resources. We are here to support you in every way possible and if you're struggling then we're going to find a way to assist you It does mandate now that 
These people must be members of your school safety committee. So this is an update. One or more reps of an office of emergency management, city level and or county level. One or more reps of the local police and or sheriff's office. One or more reps of the district's police department, if applicable. The board president. A board member other than the president. District's superintendent. One or more designees of the superintendent that he or she says, I want this classroom teacher. Okay. If you have a charter school in your district, then a member of an open enrollment charter school governing body if they are partnered with the charter school. And then two parents or guardians of schools. I've been getting a lot of calls about that one. Okay. So I'm going to share a little story. When I first came to Harris County, I worked for the Public Health Department. I was in charge of the Strategic National Stockpile, the SNS program. That is how you all first met me or heard my name. So one day, CDC had picked Harris County as a national model for what we were doing for our Strategic National Stockpile Planning. They contacted us and said, we're coming down, we're going to do a webinar. So we used SciFair ISD. We went to Sci Springs High School. Again, my ex now coached there. And so he could get all his football players, baseball players, class students to participate in this. They participated in our strategic national stockpile training. We walked them through, they picked up the medicine, they pretended like they had this ailment and that ailment. And at the end, we sat with them and did an AAR, after action review, and it was amazing what these students thought of. And they took it seriously. It wasn't joking, it wasn't. They sat there and they said, my grandma has this. How are you going to make sure? And they pointed out some things we hadn't thought of. So what I'm saying is don't be afraid. Don't let that terrify you. Okay? You may get the wrong parent. Yeah, but you deal with them on a daily basis anyhow, right? So if you get the right parent in there, it can benefit you. Now, if you need to talk about something privately, just like at a board meeting, you go into executive session. So you can come in and you can say, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start our committee meeting now. Here's our agenda. We are now going into executive session. Parents, would you please step up? An hour and a half later, <laughs> you open the door and you say, please come back in. That adjourns our meeting, our next meeting will be. Right? I'm not saying that's how you're going to do it, obviously. But you get the picture, right? That's the point. Okay. And, just real quick, it does not mean that every single one of those persons have to be at every single meeting. Okay. Now, it would be great if you get your superintendent at that first meeting to kick it off. Probably after that, he may, she may show up. What's really important? Sign-in <coughs> sheets and documentation. Keep your documentation that they were invited via email or however. Keep the documentation. That's what's really important. Have sign-in sheets. Okay. okay, you must meet at least once during each academic semester and once during the summer. None of that has changed. If you're a year-round school, none of our schools here are year-round, are they? Okay, you must post the meetings in the same manner you post the school board meetings, okay? So that's new too, is that they now need to be posted. So however you do your school board meeting, go ahead and just post those. Okay, your school safety committee must work hand in hand with your emergency operations planning team. Like I said, it may be overlapping. It most likely will be overlapping. They are now says in, in Senate Bill 11 that they must participate in developing and implementing emergency plans consistent with the district's ha multi hazard emergency plans. Okay. Like I said, it's most likely it's going to be overlapping. Provide the district with any campus facility or support services in 
information required in connection with a safety and security audit or another report required to be submitted by the district to Texas School Safety Center. So that's nothing really new either. You've always sent your audit reports to the Texas School Safety Center. Then you should review those reports. If anything needs to be changed, updated, you know, just make sure you're, you're doing it in a timely manner. stuff though I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. But now it says periodically provide recommendations to the district's board of trustees and administration regarding updating the district's EOP in accordance with best practices identified by the agency, the Texas School Safety Center, or a person included in the registry established by the Texas School Safety Center. Right now that registry is pulled down. It's pulled down because there was never a system for really vetting it or a consistent checklist of who makes that registry. Our new readiness division is now in charge of the, reg the registry and they'll be making the recommendations on how we include people on that registry. Okay, just like we want to work with our, our fire departments, we want to consult with law enforcement. For school districts that do or do not have your own police department, I believe a best practice, and I always share this, is some of you probably have a little office space available in the front of the school, near the principal or in that area. Invite your local law enforcement. And then again, think outside the box. That could be DPS. That could be the constables, it could be, you know, any law enforcement agency. Say, you know what, I see you sitting over there every day for two hours in your car doing paperwork. How about we give you this space with a fresh pot of coffee and you come sit in our school with your vehicle parked out front of our school and sit here and do your paperwork. I'm married to law enforcement. I really see them saying, yeah, that would be awesome. We would love that. And <laughs> so, and then while they're in there, you're, you're getting that rapport with them. You're getting building trust. They're starting to know your staff. They might even start knowing some of your parents. And one day when they're in there, you walk in and say, by the way, Joey. So, you know, think outside of the box. Be very creative. Talk to your law enforcement and say, what do you need? When I was developing the Strategic National Stockpile Program, I never went into the school and said, this is what I'm doing. I said, this is what I've been charged to accomplish, and I can't do it alone. This is nothing that's changed. Every three years, it's a three-year cycle, you, you do your safety and security audit. Right now, you are all in, like, year three, so you should be doing your safety and security school audits, if you haven't already, off facilities, including bus barns, maintenance buildings, it's not just instructional facilities, and then report it to Texas School Safety Center. None of that has changed. This is kind of our procedures we use. We put this in here for the charter schools because it is new to them, but I'm just going to kind of skip over this one. So for you right now, your school district cycle is 9-1-2017 to 8-3-1-2020. So that's when your audit reports need to be to the center. Audit procedures are developed by the center. Again, we are vetting a registry. That's, that means if your school district doesn't do the audits internally, here's a registry you can look at and maybe contact some of these people and say, hey, can you come out and do our audits for us? Amy, do you know when that will be up, like when we can apply? To... I have it on here. But what do you mean, what, when you can apply? So, um, because we're doing... Um, oh, I sure, yeah, I know, you, I know you guys do, do the audits also. Um, no, I don't. Again, I'm so sorry that our readiness division, who's a one-man person right now, oh, okay. And he is just, you know, <laughs> he's drowning at the moment. But he's getting help. Like I said, he's getting help. So, so, so 
Districts must certify that funds provided to the district through the safety allotment under 42168 were actually used for that purpose. Okay. So that's funding that you can use to go through a registry, go through a Department of Education or another agency to provide those safety security audits if you don't do them internally. There are, I was told on Monday, there are nine subject topics that you can actually use that money for, and it's very strict and very, you know. Okay. So the audits must be signed by the school superintendent. Again, nothing new. In addition, so the Texas School Safety Center are, is now charged. This is our charge. In addition to random audit reviews, the center may require districts to submit its EOP if the district's audit results indicate that the district is not complying with application standards. Again, this is not to crack the whip at you. This is just that we, we reviewed the audit report or we reviewed your EOP and there's something missing. Like I said, the first time I turned in my plan for compliancy, I lost the county millions of dollars. We didn't really lose it, but that could have been the consequence. Okay? Never ever gonna let that happen to you. I know what that felt like. Okay. We are not here to put you through that. We are here to guide you and assist you. Again, we added that readiness division. They're the ones you'll be working with on that side of it. The Texas um, Training and Education Division, which I am, EOP related stuff, that's us. The compliance will all be the readiness division. Okay, school districts. Okay. Your 2017-2020 cycle audit submission will ask you about the new legislation. So, okay, it'll come out soon, in January, okay? So you're gonna get it soon. An email already went out to all districts. Most likely, the email went to your district superintendent <coughs> from our research division that says, who in your district are you still the point of contact to receive the audit reporting tool? So that email already went out. So you might want to check with your superintendent and say, hey, did you get an email from the Texas School Safety Center? Your superintendent has to say, yes, please put Brian also on the notifications, because he is going to be the one that does the report, all right? Okay, EOP, check. School safety committees, check. Threat assessment teams, okay. We are providing threat assessment team training at every education services center, okay. all 20. We just got additional funding for in the spring to start the same training again. We are also working with Sigma. That's not Sigma. Is it Sigma? Yeah. Sigma, sound wrong. We are also working with them to develop our own training based off the uh, United States Secret Service recommendations so that we now, Texas Center now owns that training. Because right now, we contract, we pay Sigma to come out. Okay, we're going to work with them to develop where it, it's owned by Texas School Safety Center and that our folks can come out and we can do that training. And we can also hopefully in the future provide a trainer trainer. Okay, it's a preventative system. If you sit in that training, you're going to find out this. It's, it's about compassion. It's not about profiling. Okay. So what is threat assessment? What threat assessment is not? It's a team approach. It's not just automatically suspending. It's not automatically. You don't want to do things that's going to escalate or isolate the person any further. Threat assessment teams. Okay? Now the school safety committee, it was very specific that it must be this person, this person, this person. Not that they have to attend every meeting because that's impossible. Now for your threat assessment teams, this is saying the expertise needs to belong to the team. The expertise. So it doesn't mean you have to have a counselor, a behavioral management person, a mental health substance person. That could be your school counselor can fill all those roles. He or she has the expertise. 
So we're focusing here on the expertise that needs to be on the school threat assessment teams. Depending on the situation, depending on the individual, you may bring in an outside person who isn't normally on your threat assessment teams. But depending on what's going on, you need this person's expertise for this particular situation. Okay? Maybe he likes to start fires. I don't see fire up there at all. But because this individual likes to start fires, we might want to bring in our local fire department who has already has a relationship with the school district. <laughs> Again, don't work in a silo. We are so afraid to share information because of HIPAA and what's the other one? So the F or BRPA. Okay, you got it. Okay. If you sit through this training, we're going to tell you it's okay to share. What you witness with your eyes, what you observe, is not FERPA. Protected. Okay. Again, depending on how large your district is or how small your district is. You may have one district team that supports all your schools. Or you may have a district team that develops the policies and procedures and then shares that with each school campus assessment team. There is no right or wrong. It's what works for you. OK, now I'm getting that, that was threat assessment teams. Again, we're offering that training. I encourage you all to take that training. Right now we allow five per district at each ESC we go to because of the mandate and we gotta make sure we're hitting all the districts, but we're going to do it again in the spring. There is nothing that says your district cannot reach out directly to Sigma and say, can you come down? Spring ISD offered to coordinate, offered some space that also, I know the Department of Ed would do this also. You can bring Sigma here. And again, focus on this region, these districts, and have them do training. Yes, there's a cost to that. They have said they will charge you the same rate they're charging us, which is a really good rate, and I don't know what it is offhand. But also, there is funding available that you can apply for to use towards that. But we're going to be offering it again. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we have training coming up January 16th, and one of the January 16th. Okay. Sheldon ISD. Sheldon ISD. All right. Okay. Very good. So, another opportunity. So, now some additional laws. Re require school districts peace officers, which now the number per students has been stricken. So, now you can have a peace officer in every classroom. Right. So require school district peace officers and school resource officers to complete active shooter response training. And that's part of their TCLO training. And that's made available through the law enforcement systems. Require a district employee, a peace resource officer, to create policy requiring officers to complete education and training before within 180 days of placement. So there's that no longer that 30,000 enrollment minimum that says you can only have one per that. So, you know, whatever your district can afford, I guess, or work out contract with mutual aid agreements. Our, our center also offers TCLO 4064 to all law, en law enforcement. Okay. But what I've learned today from that is maybe we need to include our fire folks also and our EMS folks in this training. I wrote that down. I'm taking it back. So thank you. Officers who began employment before September 1, before September 1, Okay, have until August 31st, 2020 to complete the training. And you all know what the training that is, I'm assuming. So, we're good. Okay. Just some more information about your SROs. Okay. This is saying now that SROs are expected, they're there to protect, they're there to fulfill the law enforcement issues in your school. They're not there to drive your bus, okay? They're not there to, okay? So this is stating that your SROs, your police officer duties, must be included in the district's improvement plan under section 11252, student code of conduct, okay? memorandum of understandings, 
should be in place. And other campus or district activists describe the roles of peace officers and school resource, resource officers or security personnel in the district. Some of you might have just contracted with security personnel that's just sitting at the front, you know, when people come in and out. In determining the law enforcement duties under subsection D, the Board of Trustees of the school district shall coordinate with district campus behavior coordinators and other district employees to ensure that school district peace officers, school resource officers, and security personnel are tasked with duties related. Okay? Duties related to law enforcement intervention and not tasked with behavioral or administrative duties. Okay. I'll tell you what, when I taught in Tomball, we had an awesome SRO. And he, he was engaged 100% in each individual's life. And you need to make those relationships, especially with the law enforcement person in that school district. We want the students to see them as a trusted, individual <coughs> trusted adult so that if something is worrisome or they see something that they think hey you know what we want them to be able to go to your resource officer your whoever your law enforcement officer is so even though it says tasked only with duties related to law enforcement again think outside that box Law enforcement must notify the school district regarding a student where there is reasonable belief that the student has engaged in conduct defined as a felony. Okay? That's nothing new. If they're out on the weekend, they're out after school hours, and they get in trouble, then if it's related to school, concerned for school, law enforcement is going to contact you. Law enforcement agencies shall provide the superintendent or designee information relating to the school, to the, sorry, to the student, for the purpose of conducting a threat assessment team or safety review. Again, all this stuff we really hit hard in our threat assessment training. So, Amy, can I stop you? Because this is a point of contention. Okay. Our local police departments are very good about letting us know that. The thing that I've realized is one of my kids gets arrested in San Antonio, uh -huh. they have no clue. Right. And, and so, what I'd like to see is. Maybe the school safety center could do this, but a registry of what's the contact for every district so that they can send that information. Because okay. these kids get arrested around the state and we don't find out about it unless they open their mouth and yeah. tell us. But, but you know, a guy in West Texas doesn't know anything about children. Mm -hmm. But if they know, hey, I can go to the, the site, right. you know, and here's my contact, that would help. Brian, I appreciate that. That's a very good point. It's something I haven't even thought of. So yes, I will definitely take that back to the center. Um, it could be something we work with with Task Beyond too. Again, a policy that says. Okay. So thank you for putting that out. Okay. We have House Bill 1387 has removed the restric restriction on the number of marshals for per campus and allows for private schools to appoint school marshals. So. Some districts in this area may have school marshals. It's now saying you can have multiple school marshals. Okay. Bomb threat notification. Again, this is, gets back to that slide earlier where we're talking about immediate notification. So, notification regarding bomb threats or terroristic threats. This also talks about that interoperability the communication system that your school already has in place and being able to use it to support this. Okay. A school district that receives a bomb threat or terroristic threat relating to a campus or other district facility at which students are present shall provide notification of the threat, see what that says? As soon as possible. And in the earlier slide it said provide immediate. How does the school district decide what's a terroristic threat versus an incident that requires immediate. So again, I'm telling you, have a way to immediately notify your community because your students are going to. But again, best practice, talk to them about, we're going to let you know something's going on, but we need you to trust us that we're conducting an investigation, we're gathering all the factual information, and as soon as we can provide factual information 
to you, to our community, it will be released. You own your incident. Remember that. Okay. Even if it's law enforcement centered, fire investigation centered, you still own the incident. That's where you want to get into that unified command that was mentioned. And work together to release that message. But it's always going to be your message. It should be your message. Your parents and community are looking to you. Oh, I heard this conversation during lunch. Okay? Trauma injury response protocols. Bye. I thought it was January 1st. Okay. I know because one of my goals when I was at Office of Emergency Management and I was working with Region 4 and I was working with Texas School Safety Center. I was sitting on a first responder committee at the governor's level, and we were tasked with trying to get every single district trained and stop the bleed. So I worked very closely with the Texas School Safety Center to make sure that happens. I know here in this region, you guys are rocking because I just keep track of it. So I know most of the districts, you are so fortunate because you have set track that they're the agency that coordinates all the hospitals and EMS, set track. They provide the uh, stop the lead training and also your local EMSs. I know Klein, they come out and they train for free. I know that the department, Harris County Department of Education is providing this, giving you the opportunity. What you need to realize though too is that it needs to be open to all staff. This could include bus drivers now. Remember, we gotta think larger. We got to remember our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, our maintenance, our grounds crews. All of them need to have this training provided to them. Again, you cannot force somebody to attend, but make it available. Schools closing for half the day, let the other half be stop the lead training or whatever training you choose to fulfill this mandate. Yes, sir. I was going to say that the other challenge with it, and, and I keep hearing different things, but there is a compliance stop the lead kit and many, many, many non compliance stop the lead kits. Uh, people are able to access and get for free the non compliance stop the lead kits, uh, but they don't necessarily, well, I don't know what role they fulfill <coughs> other than at least being a temporary stop the lead. Uh, so there's no funding. There actually is funding for these kits now, and I'll, if you guys want to hang around, I'll show you that. Okay, Brian? So another possibility for funding, uh, one of our local EMS, North Channel EMS, uh, they agreed to partner with us. They agreed to build the kits, so they got all of the supplies to build a compliant kit. The kits wound up being $25 a kit is what they were. That was two turns, get all the other things in the kit, the bag to hang in. Uh, so they provided half of them Check with your local, especially if you have an emergency services district, check with those people because you may have a combined fire, EMS, or separate one, but check with them because one, the training they'll do for free, and the other is they may have access to some money that will help you out to get kids into the schools Absolutely. that have their jurisdiction. Absolutely. Does the trainer need to be certified? Or and, yes, and Trish, it's easy, easy. Yeah. So what we did was, I'm thinking, um, one of the things that we did was we did a train and trainer class. More Channel EMS came out and we trained every nurse so that every campus has a trainer on the campus. And then some of our law enforcement folks, we trained the same way. And so that what we did was we did every campus before the start of school did their training. Uh, and then we've gone back to hit every auxiliary point. And so it's large groups. We get our local folks to help us, but our local fire departments, Lincoln Park Fire, Santa City, each of those taught the schools that were in that jurisdiction. Uh, and then it really does help, but the training is easy. It, you know, it's not a long, drawn-out thing uh, that you can do, and then you have people who are able to do that. 
Uh, think about your athletic trainers, your licensed athletic trainers. They make good folks to do that. Your nurses are. So that if we have mid-year hires, we run them through the nurse so that the nurse can make sure they know stop and leave. Uh, but there's some people that will partner with that that will make it work yeah, a whole lot better. Absolutely. We had the Harris County Department of Ed come into our district this afternoon to do a stop and go They found a trainer. So the, the 15 people that will show up to that, will, can they go then to their campuses? And that is not a trainer trainer. It has to be a trainer yes, trainer. Right. Now you're in ESD5, okay? Talk to your folks at Crosby ESD5, and I'm pretty sure they'll work with you to help get that in and take care of their good folks. Oh, I'm, I'm after saying, reach out to your local State Farm Insurance companies and stuff. They'll possibly support you and provide some income for that. How many kids? How many kids? Okay, how many kids? Each district shall make available a trauma form kit. Okay. Again, you are all smart people. Okay. A kit at the administration office is not. You all heard the stories about Santa Fe and the police officer. Okay. That's all I need to say, right? So I know funding can be Difficult. There is funding for this. There are ways to do this. Again, think outside the box. Again, having those local contacts with those emergency responders. And you can say, mention it in front of them, and they're like, well, you know what? I actually know of a program that can get us some funding that we can help support you. Okay. Yeah, real quick, I think this is one of those things that the fire marshal been talking about, too. I think we're going to see in the future where stop the lead kits. The AEDs are thinking they're going to be incorporated in the fire code. And then basically the fire code officials are going to be the ones that's going to be charged with making sure that they're checked annually and, and in compliance. I also see code changes where code changes may be these are going to be all like fire extinguishers. Where was fire extinguisher? It's one of these kids. What I want to point out, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm like out of time, but what I want to point out is train for students in grades 7 plus. That means. Students in 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade need to have the opportunity to be trained in Stop the Bleed. A lot of you have those CERT teams in your schools. That's a great way to incorporate it. Okay, But you need to make it available that it can't be on a Saturday when they don't have transportation and they can't get to it. If it is on a Saturday, then you, give, you make your buses available so you can get the students there. It says that that must be trained, believe it or not, by an SRO. Okay? Again, my husband's law enforcement, love him, but I don't think I want him doing the stop the lead training to, to the students. <laughs> or another staff personnel. So that could be your nurses, that could be your um, athletic trainers. Okay? They want somebody who's already connected with the students in the school system to provide this training. Because it is a little scary. When we go through the train, we're wrapping it on ourselves and we're leaving it there until literally we can't feel our, our legs and stuff. So, okay, just more about Stop the Bleed. It says TA2 has a list of approved. They have two on their approved list that you can use. Both of them, I believe, follow Stop the Bleed. No later than January 1st, 2020, each school district and charter school shall develop and implement the protocols. I think you guys are already there. You've been doing this. Okay. If you need assistance, don't recreate the wheel. Brian here with Galena Park, I think, has it all has it all in place. So borrow, steal, put your name on it. I'm almost done. Okay? Faculty facility standards. Again, commissioner rules will be finalized in spring of 2020. So there's not much I can say about that. We're still waiting for TEA. Texas School Safety Center approval of the safety training courses as per TEA, instructional time waivers. You all know what instructional, instructional time waivers are. I had to learn that. But this is something that's great. 
We sent our list to TEA, and it's the online FEMA courses for ICS 100, 200, 700, 800. That's the list we sent out that we recommended. So if you need a time waiver, your staff, including, please remember, substitute teachers and your cafeteria workers and your bus drivers, they can use the ICS trainings that are for free online. How many hours each of those? It, it depends on every individual. It might say... Using whatever FEMA says they're supposed yes, to be? Yes, yes. Two to four hours. Thank you. Okay, mental health, we hired a mental health specialist working closely with TEA weekly to make sure that the guidance that comes down is consistent. I'm hurrying, guys. Okay, assistance is here. This is like almost my last slide. Threat assessment trainings, we're conducting. Digital threat assessments, we're currently conducting. T close, 40, 64, they're ongoing. Standard response protocols, SRPs. If, if a district has not been in an SRP training, I really highly encourage you all to, to attend that. In the spring, starting in February, we are starting our emergency operations planning and our audit trainings. Okay. First day will be EOP, second day will be audits. And we'll continue doing threat assessments. Okay. Here's our website. Go to events, and you can sign up for any of these trainings. This is where you can find additional trainings. If you go to tools, that's where you'll find all the toolkits. The emergency operation plan, the EOP toolkit, the safety and security audit toolkit. Okay. Videos, I'll show you right here. Videos, we put out videos as soon as Senate Bill 11 came out. We're constantly updating them. We can't go back and update the video even though we're trying. So if you click on each video, under it you're going to see a red ribbon. And the red ribbon will say updated information. If something came from us, the commission rule came to us today, we're going to go under the appropriate video and we're going to add it to that Word document. So that's where you can find all the updated information. It's hidden. You wouldn't know that. So I want to make sure I'm getting that word out. Go to those videos, underneath there'll be a red ribbon, and it'll say updated information as of October 2019, as of. And if you go to our webpage, like I said, Portable Buildings Best Practice, on our main webpage is the funding information that TEA now has. There's millions of dollars available that you can use for safety type things that, we, that he was talking about. Everything he was talking about today that a school district might need, <coughs> there's funding available. Amy, can I tag on to that? Yes, please. If you don't have a grant department, we do have grant, a grant provision here that um, we service Harris County. So if you're looking at the grants and need help with writing it, we, um, we found out we didn't, um, we can't apply oh. for those, but we can help you all get them. So if that's something that you all need help with, please contact us so we can um, get you a connection and get this, this money that is Absolutely. Needed. What a wonderful resource. So the Harris County Department of Education's grant section can work with your individual districts yes. to help you apply for some of this funding, walk you through the paperwork. Yes. Okay? Take them up on it, people. All right. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to stick around. If there's questions, I have my law book with me so we can turn and look up things if we need clarification. So I'll be here as long as you need me here. Department of Education, thank you for bringing me home. Thank you. I was always taught the best thing you can do is find a resource, grab onto it, connect to it, and build a relationship uh, that you can call up on people. And I appreciate Amy for coming in. And I, I'm glad she remembers Houston as her home. <laughs> um, I'm going to put up, we, like we said, we, on our agenda, we have the QR code to scan to do the survey. I also created a bit.ly, give me a second, here for you to go out and do as well. Because this is how we build as our uh, quarterly meetings. Because we want them to be of value to 